Right now on Sports Extra, how about those Falcons, huh? Four and two on the year, their best start in eight years. We're breaking it down as they got the win against the Panthers. We'll head up to Shar to check in with Maria Martin as the Falcons are undefeated in the division. Plus, Georgia and Georgia Tech are gearing up for their biggest games of the year. What we're taking away from both teams' wins this weekend that could set them up to success the next time that they hit the field. And by the way, basketball season is almost here, folks, and there are a lot of new faces on the Hawks. Our early impression of Quinn Snyder's team. It's a jam-packed episode of Sports Extra. I got my friends with me, and it starts right now. Hello and welcome in, everybody. I'm Reggie Chapman. Welcome to Sports Extra. What a great time it is to be a sports fan. College and NFL football both rolling. The baseball postseason has been electric. NBA basketball is getting started and much more. But the Falcon season has been fun so far, which is where we will start tonight's show. Let's get right into it and allow me to direct your attention to this. What a start to the year for the Falcons. Four and two, undefeated in the division, thanks to a 38-20 win over Carolina this afternoon. The offense is clicking on all fronts. The defense still has some work to do, but the Falcons are riding high after winning three straight this season. Big win, huge win. You know, uh, third in a row, uh, fired up for the guys and how they played and the maturity of the team to get better and better every single week. Um, for things not to go perfect, but to come out on the winning side of the ball game is, uh, is always great. Always great. Let's welcome in our guest, Cody Chavins from Dog Nation. John Michaels from 680. The fan Falcons are 4-2 and two for the first time since 2016. John, what is your biggest takeaway? Well, the biggest takeaway is you did what you were supposed to do. You went on the road and beat a division opponent. I get it. It wasn't the prettiest game, but division wins, no matter how they are, to get the 3-0 and is exactly what you want to do. You had the running game going bananas. Bijan and Tyler Algier were able to get almost 200 yards. And then the passing game, it seems like there's a pecking order now. Drake London becomes number one. And then the defense, Ben, 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 but didn't break enough as you come away with the win. Falcons were able to tote that rock. Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier, very good at toting that rock. Uh, they're the best one-two punch in the NFL. You got to believe so. They really got rolling today. You saw Bijan get 95, a couple of touchdowns, and then Tyler Algier comes in. And it's if people like to think of it as thunder and lightning, but I think that undersells Algier's speed. He's really a quick guy as well. And Bijan can and stick his nose right up the middle as well. But it's great to see him going. This this offensive line is at its best when they are run blocking, so they got going downhill, controlled the game in the second half, and exactly what you wanted to do in a game, you just needed to go up there and, like John said, take care of business. It felt like at times this game was more of a slugfest than it probably actually was. After the Falcons had that fumble, they scored on their next six drives when you don't talk about the two different times that Kirk Cousins kneeled things down. John, where do you kind of feel like this offense is? Have they reached their final form? Uh, I don't think their final form, but they're definitely getting to the right place. Zach Robinson got a lot of criticism those first three weeks and rightly so you couldn't finish drives you were settling for field goals you were scoring 10 points against Pittsburgh but guess what now all of a sudden you have found different ways to beat people 500 yards through the air against Tampa in a game that you needed every single one of them this week it was more about the running game and I think he's finding what works best in certain situations Kirk Cousins seems real comfortable and I think guys are finally falling into place you're seeing Kyle Pitts one route notwithstanding come coming up with some big catches and then Darnell Mooney being a number two in the this passing game has been really good. Look, it wasn't over 500 yards for Kirk Cousins, but you'll take 19 for 30 for 222, a touchdown and no pick. So you feel really good about that. The defense, meanwhile, they did come up with two interceptions in this game on a day where the Panthers offense did do some nice things at times. So, Cody, my question to you is, what do you say to the Falcons fans that I'm sure are overreacting right now to the fact they gave up 20 points to the Panthers? Well, let, let's be happy about A.J. Terrell getting a pick for the first time in forever. He got, makes a lot of money and finally gets a takeaway. You also had Clark Phillips shining there at the end, but boy, Chuba Hubbard. You get players like this, I feel like in every sport, that just against Atlanta is a thorn in your side. Yep. He ran all over the Falcons, and then dead last in the NFL in sacks. How long have we been playing that tune for the Falcons defense? Gotta get after the quarterback. You bring in Judon, you're still down there at the, in the basement getting after the quarterback. Just trying to get after the quarterback, but look, a win is a win, and it wasn't a stressful win for really the first time this entire season. Less stressful for the fans at home and out in Charlotte. That's where we find our Maria Martin, who joins us now with more on the game. 
Hey, Reggie. Yeah, I'm here with 92.9 The Games, Joe Patrick. And, Joe, this was a really great game for the Falcons because, as they were talking about a little while ago, this one did not come down to the very last plays of the fourth quarter. They were able to put this game away. Pretty nice comfortability for them, especially offensively. And three guys that had a really good day, Drake London, Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier. What did you notice about the way that the offense was able to work together and do it well? Yeah, quite the ho-hum 30-burger that this team put up here in Charlotte yeah. today. And it's great to see not them just put up the points, but then to take that lead, take control of the game, and then, like you said, with those running backs, Bijan Robinson, Tyler Algier, to just be able to salt the thing away and to actually successfully do it. I was talking to Jake Matthews about this. So many teams want to be in that position, maybe put themselves in position to do that, but can't ultimately get that ground yards that they need. Yeah. And this team was able to do that tonight. It speaks a lot to the amount of tools that they're adding to their tool belt over the course of this first six games of the year. That is what championship teams do. 198 yards on the ground. It is the highest rushing mark for them to this point this season. Kirk Cousins said earlier in the week they needed to run the football to be successful against Carolina. They certainly did that and did it well. Let's talk about defensively for a second. You heard the guys talking about the lack of pass rush for the Falcons. Second game this year, zero sacks. Grady Jarrett in the locker room told me that they are trying to improve that area. But look, A.J. Terrell with a takeaway in a critical moment of this game. What did you notice about specifically that point for A.J. Terrell? Yeah, make no mistake, first of all, the pass rush does need to improve. This team yeah. is still last in the NFL in sacks, still last in the NFL in pressures, but this team has a crazy resilience in the second half. They have been a better defense in the second half in almost every game they've played this year, and they especially create turnovers, and A.J. Terrell represented that tonight, making that great interception, and then not only did he make the interception, but what Kirk Cousins said after the game was that the team was able to then play complimentary football after that, drive down the field and score a touchdown. That's ultimately what changed the game, those two things in tandem, and that's what they were able to play off tonight and Look, led them to a win. Yeah, let's talk about the fact that this team is 4-2 and two right now. Kirk Cousins swag surfing here in Carolina, literally, as he's walking to the tunnel. The vibes are really good, but there was a really big moment that he said after the game, the fact that after Thursday night football, a lot of emotions were running high for this team, and he was a little worried heading into Carolina, right? He said it right after that game, that it gets his blood boiling when teams dwell on past results, be them good or bad, and especially yeah. after a really positive result against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, dramatic emotional win, for them to get over that, and like the guys were saying, a team that you should beat tonight in the Carolina Panthers, this team was able to focus, get down to business, and take care of the job that they needed to get done tonight, and it puts them in great position to win this division because you took care of your home games, but now you come on the road and you take one, again, one that you should win, and it sets them up with the best record they've had since they went to the Super Bowl in 2016. Unbelievable. Drake London, he has four touchdowns in five games. That's the highest to his, po his point in his career, but he said, we still left meat on the bone, meaning this offense has a lot of work to do. They feel like they're just getting started to what they can accomplish this year. For Joe Patrick, I'm Maria Martin. Reggie, back to you. All right, thanks, guys. Before we get to the first break, Mark Sanchez did call out Kyle's pitch for a couple of plays during this game. It's what everybody's talking about on Twitter right now. He had a lazy route and had a play where he got he was quitting on a play, which you're about to see in a second, led to really my question here, John. How much of his inconsistencies are on him versus what other people think is the quarterback play? Yeah, I, I think the quarterback play was two years ago. It was Marcus Mariota. It was Desmond Ritter. What I'm seeing right now, and Mark Sanchez called it out and very poignant, like the entire time, Kyle Pitts has a, a corner fade basically and and you you have Kirk Cousins trying to throw it to the back pylon and Kyle Pitts stops at the front of the end zone and never really gives it a full effort right now, here right what I saw a year ago yeah or a week ago against Tampa he was making unbelievable effort his play to dive out of bounds on the game winning or the game tying drive ended up being one of the biggest plays that play there is inexcusable that's something you cannot happen from a guy you took fourth overall and the question is always started to be does he love football and that's a play you gotta love football all all the time. You can't just love it in overtime at home with a hype crowd. You got to love it in moments like that. And that's the question. And this is a place where you brought in Kirk Cousins, right? To get in somebody, be a leader. He can be a leader here and get in his ear about that. The timeline is talking about it. It feels like every week we're talking about Kyle right. for some reason. <laughs> uh, we do want to talk about this. The, the Falcons 3-0 so far in the division, John. Mm -hmm. um, is this their division to lose as they're right now in first place? Well, it comes down to them in Tampa. I think New Orleans now with a rookie quarterback, Spencer Rattler, they gave up 51 points. Couldn't happen to a better group today. It's good to see them really <laughs> bow up against Tampa. But you've got a road trip against them. And let's be real, it took everything you had to beat the Buccaneers, and that was with the Bucs having some injuries. I think it comes down to those two teams. I think there's a chance that both of them make 
make the playoffs, but to win the division, you're probably going to have to go to Tampa and steal one down there. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one in a couple of weeks, but you can lead up to that and be ready. And yeah, I think New Orleans and obviously Panthers are going to come here. Those you feel good about. So yeah, you're in, you're in the catbird seat. They're feeling good. I'm sure Falcons fans are feeling good at home, man. A, a stress-free Sunday for <laughs> yes. them two weeks in a row. Love to see it. All right, let's talk about some college football after the break, man. What an exciting weekend. Breaking down both Georgia and Georgia Tech's wins over the weekend as both teams gear up for huge matchups next weekend. All right, welcome back to Sports Extra, everybody. Dogs on top again in Athens on Saturday as they beat Mississippi State. Something that we figured would happen, but the 10-point win wasn't really aesthetically pleasing. 41-31. Uh, to 31. Let's break it all down. Still rocking with me, John Michaels and Cody Chaffins. Cody, you were right there next to me on the field in Athens last night. A big night for Carson Beck. We had a career-high 459 yards passing, three touchdowns, two interceptions, though. He did throw it 48 times. Is this a way that they should be winning games, or do you think they should be more balanced going forward? I, I think they want to be balanced. It's a Kirby Smart team, so they always want to run the football, but it seemed to work last night, and really a lot of those passing yards were throwing it out on a quick screen, and that's an extension of the run game. Kirby Smart will be quick to tell you that, but yeah, Carson is starting to finally hit his stride a little bit, which is nice. I think it goes back to the second half of the Alabama game. Now, although Georgia didn't win that game, I did feel afterwards, it, like a shooter sometimes, it's good to see the ball go through the hoop and he had just been you know, stumbling through the first few games of the season. He kind of hit a stride there, and we've seen him kind of keep that up, that connection with Arian Smith. If they can start making that a little more consistent, that's how you compete in a game like next week. I think he's the one elite player Georgia has on offense. Yeah. I think everybody else offensively, good players, really good players, they're not elite. Carson Beck was a Heisman Trophy contender because he's an elite player. He has to make guys like Arian Smith and Trevor Etienne and Dylan Bell, he's got to make them better players. You know why? Lad McConkey's in the NFL. Brock Bowers is in the NFL. I don't think their offensive line without Tate Ratledge is dominant the way that they have been in the past. Carson Beck stepping up his game. You're going to need that coming up Saturday night down in Austin, Texas. 36 completions tied a school record. Uh, man, the offense looked good. One punt the entire game. The defense, though, it was kind of a tale of two halves. The first half, they didn't allow a first, uh, a, a first, a first down in the first quarter. The second half, not that great. 21 points in the final two frames. What's the biggest problem on defense, Cody? It's the secondary. The ball goes up in the air, and those guys look totally lost, whether it's Dalen Everett. It was a little bit of everybody. You saw Daniel Harris right there lose a man right there. It happened. We talked about the Bama game, that Ryan Williams catch at the end. The ball's in the air, and these guys have no awareness of where the football is, and that is Kirby's, you know, he's a safety at heart. That's his bread and butter, but his cornerback play has been below par. Is the answer to that bringing in the five-star freshman, Ellis Robinson. Kirby Smart had really good things to say about him after the game on Saturday, and we saw him kind of make an interception out of bounds. He looks like he's going to get more playing time. I don't know if that's the answer moving forward, but the secondary is suspect right Mississippi now. Mississippi State's quarterback, Michael Van Buren, a true freshman. It was his second career start through for 307 yards, three touchdowns, did have that interception. This is, it doesn't, even though they're number five in the country, John, it doesn't feel like the same Georgia team that we've seen the last couple of years, five and one at this point. Can you pinpoint maybe the difference other than the fact they just don't have the same talent the last couple of years? Or is that the biggest thing? That is the biggest thing. There you know why? Name, image, likeness, transfer for portal. You lost 16 kids in the portal, and I know they're depth pieces, but you know what that ends up being? That's competition throughout the week. That could be a guy filling in for injury. There's a reason I think there's 12 teams that can win a national title right now in college football, and I don't know that there's a dominant team. I think Texas is really good. I think Oregon's obviously really good. I still think Ohio State and Georgia and Miami and a bunch of other teams have chances, but I think as name, image, and likeness and transfer portal continues to be a thing, you're not going to see those teams dominate the way they have in the past. And I think that's important important to think, you know, Georgia fans have gotten so used to thinking their team needs to be on this level above everybody else. They're kind of with the crowd this year, but the good news is everybody has warts. No team's perfect. We've seen it a couple times now with Alabama. We've seen it even Oregon after they get the big win against Ohio State early in the season. They didn't look all put together. Ohio State obviously has now lost the game. So that's the good news is that everybody has their warts. Nobody's perfect. And I think a lot of it is because of the depth is missing because they go to places like Arkansas, is Avian Sword. Or Vandy. Or, yeah, and they're, they're getting to start there. Or they go to Kentucky or wherever they go, and they can go get playing time and make a little money as well. One of the teams that has looked at least a little close to perfect is Texas. And that's the team that Georgia will face this next week. A top five matchup. John, what are you expecting for the Dogs? Can they get it done out in Austin next week? Find a way to get pressure on Quinn Ewers. What I saw at least in the first quarter and a half against Oklahoma, he looked rusty. I'm going to be honest with you. And I, I'm in my mind going, maybe they should have stuck with Arch Manning a little bit 
bit longer because you put them back in in a huge rivalry game there. Texas has got special kids in a lot of different places, but you got to find a way to affect the quarterback, and you got to be able to block up front. Give Carson back. I know it sounds very simple. Give him time to throw. When Oklahoma had time early on, they moved the ball. George is obviously way more skilled on the offensive side than Texas is. Yeah, you mentioned Tate, Tate, Tate Radledge missing on the offensive line. Another one's Jared Wilson, the center. They've had a, a fill-in at center the last two weeks. If you can get your center back making those calls right, that's going to really help with protection as well. And, yeah, they got to figure out – how to protect Carson and how to get the running game going a little bit more than they did on Saturday. If they can do that, control the game a little bit, that's going to be a key. But the defense, it does have me worried. I think Isaiah Bond's watching that tape, licking his chops. Our old friend. He was banged up. He ended up leaving that game. Oh, yeah. So who knows if he's going to be 100%, but you're right. Yeah, all those receivers, you, you know, and Quinn Ewers, got to be thinking they can go deep on Georgia. One thing that uh, Georgia uh, head coach Kirby Smart did say post game is he feels like his guys are ready for an environment like that after having to go to Alabama and after going to Kentucky. Austin is an incredible atmosphere, so we'll be able to see what how it goes for them next week. A big game for them, also a big game next weekend for Georgia Tech, a massive home game as they host Notre Dame. This team feeling good following a dramatic win versus North Carolina capped off by a game-winning touchdown one by Jamal Haynes, who had 170 yards, two touchdowns. John, how impressed are you this season with the job that Brent Key is doing so far? You're 5-2 and two and you feel like you maybe should be 7-0. and oh. You've had a game against Syracuse where you played bad in a half. You had a game against Louisville where you shot yourself in the foot. And for a lot of this game, it felt like Georgia Tech was shooting themselves in the foot. And then Jeff Collins' defense showed up. Oh, man. How do you give up a 60 plus yard rushing touchdown with 15 seconds left on the clock. <laughs> Good job by Brent Key and company. Now you need to win one of your final five or one of, yeah, one of your final five and you're going to be bowl eligible. I think they'll have a chance to probably win two more games before it's all said and done. And I'm calling right now. George Tech upsets Notre Dame at Mercedes-Benz oh, Stadium. There's something oh, special. Upset wow. Notre Dame. There's something special when Georgia Tech gets into Mercedes-Benz Stadium for whatever it is. Ask North Carolina about mm -hmm. it. The Georgia, they, something comes over them. Yeah, I, I'm not that bold, but yeah. <laughs> got to do it without the quarter. That's the other the worry, right? As Haynes King went out of the game late against um, against North Carolina. If it's going to be a Zach Pyron game, it's a whole different game, and they're really going to have to lean on that running game. We'll talk about him in a second, but back to that run game. 371 rush yards. You mentioned that Jeff Collins' defense didn't uh, do the job very no. well against his <laughs> former team, man. Uh, Haynes King had 234 total yards, two touchdowns. Did leave in the fourth quarter, though. So, John, no word on his condition just yet. So, where are we kind of feeling on this team, if they can potentially get it done if he's not on the field. Yeah, if he's not on the field, you're going to have to lean on the running game a lot. Now, Zach Pyron is the goal line guy anyway. They bring him in for a lot of times. They're going to run the Wildcat or they're going to run something where he's just taking QB run. Can he throw it enough? Because Al Golden's defense, I can't believe I'm saying this, is really good at wow. Notre Dame. They are really solid, very fundamentally sound, and they're going to try to make Georgia Tech go on 8, 9, 10, and try to beat themselves on long drives. Tech's going to have to run the ball. You may need Haynes King to hit a couple of special plays, so hopefully he is healthy by Saturday afternoon. What's it take to get it done? Uh, controlling the game and shortening the game yeah. with the running game and, you know, keeping, uh, you know, Notre Dame's offense off the field. If you can do that, run the ball like you've been doing. I mean, this Tech team, it's fun, kind of like we talked about the Falcons. When they just win the games they're supposed to win, and right. they can, they're not shooting themselves in the foot every week. Right. In the last couple of years, it feels like they were always kind of right. shooting themselves in the foot. So it's a different time with Brent Key at the helm. Guys, basketball season's almost here. Let's talk about it. It's almost Hawks basketball season. Our early impressions of this new squad. We're talking about it after the commercial break. All right, welcome back to Sports Extra, everybody. I'm Reggie Chapman, John Michaels, Cody Chaffins in the building. I can't believe we're already talking about basketball <laughs> season, but boy, am I excited about it. The Atlanta Hawks are back, everybody. Opened up the preseason with a performance with perfect vibes. The team shot the ball back well, really, really well. The returning players have looked good. The new guys look good. And in the end, how about a game-winning three from Seth Lundy? John, is it a new era for the Hawks in Atlanta? Um, I like it. I, I was actually impressed with Risha Shea. I wasn't sure what to expect out of the number one overall pick. He played well. Now, albeit against Indiana, who I think I could still probably go out and score four or five <laughs> points against on a daily basis, but 18 points, three boards, a couple of assists. Looks like he fits in this system really well. They're going to be an up-and-down team all year. I think they're going to score a ton of points, and they're probably going to be the eighth seed. What really impressed me about Zach, he looked like he was super poised out there. Like, it didn't feel like it was his first ever game playing in the NBA. Of course, he had played overseas against men his entire life, so it feels like he was ready for this moment. Yeah, he, I like that he can dribble the ball a little bit. He goes through the legs to clean Capello, that's a cool moment. I do think, you know, he's 
because he's not that number one pick, I think he's still kind of flying under the radar. Like ESPN's not going to break in when he gets on the floor for the first time, and that's a good thing. I think there's always going to be pressure when you're that guy, but I don't think the pressure is as high. And like you said, he already kind of looks comfortable out there. Now it's a preseason game, and it's one preseason game, but that's as good as you can be in one preseason game. I'm ready to overreact, man. Uh, <laughs> one of those stat guys, he was uh, he had a 15 plus minus. He was plus oh. 15 on the day. So I mean, <laughs> rookie of the year, winning basketball is coming with yes. Zach. Reed. Hall of Fame. Shea. Okay. <laughs> Hall of Fame. I Move love over Vince Carter. Well, look, uh, four of the five starters in this game were returners. DeJounte Murray is gone now. Uh, three of those four guys finished in double digits. Why will things be different for this group in the starting offense this season versus last year? Well, because you're not going to have anything in the backcourt that's going to be seen as drama. We, okay. we can paint over it or gloss over it all we want. Obviously, Trey Young and DeJounte Murray could not coexist. That's why DeJounte is no longer here. I think it takes some pressure off of Trey. And now with Dyson Daniels, who actually likes to play defense, which is a novel concept in this town, I think he'll be good to help Trey be able to just go back to being the Trey that we all knew and loved. How about the new guys? It's all going to come down to the defense, right? Like, that's the thing to think for the Falcons. The thing for the Falcons has always been getting sacks, right? The thing for the Hawks has long time has been playing defense and winning at the end. If they can get stops and, you know, scores at the end of games, which they weren't able to do in those close games last year, that's going to be the key. So we'll see if those new guys can play some D, get them out of the basement of that. That's exactly why you bring in Dyson Daniels at 14 points, three assists, a steal. Larry Nance also played well as well. And who doesn't want to leave New Orleans and come to Atlanta? I know I would. <laughs> oh, man, hey, man. New Orleans Shots. is great. New Orleans is great. All right, we got to go uh, after the commercial break. We're talking about our video of the week. We'll see you there. Welcome back, everybody. It's our final block, and it's our video of the week. We have to talk about Major League Baseball postseason. This Francisco Lindor Grand Slam sent them to the next round, and also Lane Thomas hitting the Grand Slam versus Tarek Skubal. Is postseason baseball the best postseason of all the sports, John? Uh, not even close. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, because the second the Braves are out, I'm not watching. I'm out. <laughs> the Phillies are out, which is good. That's the only thing good that's happened in the postseason. The late starts, I don't love them. You do have to be able to hit in the postseason. So just ask the Phillies or ask Kevin. Kevin Seitzer, but anybody, you got to be able to hit in the postseason. Ooh, not so. We didn't want to hit the Braves. Not so easy when you got to take that time off, huh? Ah, yeah, yeah, Phillies. I remember that excuse last year. A lot year. of fun baseball coming up and a fun weekend of football as well. You've got Georgia Tech, Notre Dame. You got Georgia Tech, and of course the Falcons are hosting the Seahawks on Sunday. We'll see you guys next week.